Minu Ilam Makthwe, welcome everybody to uh, Learning with Sia Yatsas. Uh, learning, this is our third season. Learning of, with Sia Yatsas is an Nanaimo Lady Smith Public Schools work to support Call to Action 57 from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, raising public servants' awareness around Indigenous languages, cultures, histories. And we on this project are pleased to be uh, partnered with UBC Press, University of British Columbia Press, and uh, this year Vancouver Island Regional Library. So if you're in our regional library on Vancouver Island right now watching this, uh, welcome and I hope you enjoy this. My name is uh, Ted Cadwallader. I'm co-host with uh, Tanat, Stephanie Johnson, and Tsongkhwat and Lawrence Mitchell. And is always our way here on Okamitno speaking territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I'll turn it over to Lawrence to set us off in a good way. April E. Philip. Let's have cut and team out CIS teats on arm at a tenant whale. Let's have cut. And that's a tea we have at a scarp bit. Yeah, that's off main. I've got a high O, a squale, a tenor quail. See, when it's a wet tall, a tenor quail, a tatima, see eyes. See, when it's a wee metal, a lean shawl, a bar, a quail. See, when I'm a stall. With the ice following. T we at an kwakika lisi kaki ustima. T hum slasha can stoke banat kwama. Aichka kwat twa e etanatama etanakwail e two mug squail. Nawa squam quams the salits tita siam aichka. Oh, 
I like that we can start the, the way that gatherings have been started in this territory for thousands of years by asking ancestors um, to come and join us uh, and just with the gratitude that we're still here, still on this land. Um, we are very, very pleased today to uh, welcome two local people, too, who uh, live here in this territory, uh, Philip and April Vanini. They are filmmakers, ethnographers, uh, teachers of the knowledge that they learn along the way at Railroads University. They are authors of Wilderness and Inhabited uh, Wilderness. Wildness and the Vitality of the Land, and today's book, In the Name of Wild. They are adventurers, uh, risk takers, because they went on this adventure with a global pandemic underway. Uh, and we're so pleased that you're here to share with us a concept around wild wilderness, uh, land, language, and adventure. So uh, welcome, Minu Elam. I'm just going to unmute us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to begin by just saying haichika to, to you, Lawrence, for that beautiful opening. Um, I, I'm myself, I'm a very anxious person when I begin thinking about presentations and what a great way to just help regulate me, to get me comfortable in this space right now. So thank you so much. And uh, to you, Ted, for your warm welcome and introduction to us. And of course, uh, to Stephanie Johnson for inviting us here today um, to be able to present um, our research. Um, so today, Philip and I, um, Autumn is not here. She's at school, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's at school. Um, today, we're going to kind of begin with more of a, a, a scope of an introduction. Um, Philip and I will take about 10, maybe 15 minutes. And then we, Philip and I, learn really well through dialogue. And so um, we're going to learn with you today and, and open it up with a dialogue with Ted um, about the book and about our, some of our own ideas of wildness and wilderness and what is that like. So um, I'm going to begin um, by um, uh, introducing ourselves in a way, um, because this is really important to the research that we did was rethinking this idea of wilderness or wildness should begin by recognizing the complexities of the political and cultural relations between people and the land. Um, that recognition must start with a reflection on who we are. Um, and for the three of us, that relation is really clear. Our ancestors um, and ourselves came to this land from somewhere else, um, from Europe. Um, more specifically, I'm a third generation settler whose ancestors come from Ireland, uh, Ukraine, Sweden, on my father's side, and on my maternal side, my mother's side, from France and Germany. Um, I was born and raised in the Nemo territory. Uh, my grandparents 
uh, moved uh, to Nanaimo, British Columbia um, in the 1960s. And I grew up here and went to school here. And Philip is an immigrant whose kinship roots are from Tuscany, Italy. So Philip and I are married. Um, and we have two beautiful children, Jacob and Autumn, who also went to school in this district, and two grandchildren um, who go to school at North Oyster. So um, situating ourselves in our co uh, connections to our place, um, who we are, uh, where do we come from is extremely significant to the research um, because it unfolds uh, the complexities associated with this idea of wilderness. And um, as settlers, if I or we refer to a place as wild or as a wilderness, we call into question our history with that place, um, our relations with it. And if we call a place wild, um, because we believe it to be empty of culture or empty of human history or free of human modifications, we are unlikely to, and unaware of the very many traces of inhabitations, um, the presence of ancestor spirits and it, the countless kinships between human and non-human relations. Um, so how we understand a place is also how we understand ourselves in relation to that place. And so that's why we introduce ourselves in this way because um, it, it was significant. Um, as ethnographers, one of the key things that we learned very early on in our research is the importance of reflexivity of who you are in relation to the research. And so Philip will talk a little bit more about that now. So April and I are ethnographers, uh, but our daughter Autumn is not. Autumn is currently a grade 12 student at NDSS in Nanaimo. Ethnography is the study of culture, as practiced in the social sciences. Um, and ethnographers, um, unlike other researchers, learn directly from people, people with whom they interact as part of the research over weeks, months, even years. And as part of that uh, time, they engage in relationship building, in observation, in dialogue, in participation, in collaboration, in all kinds of daily activities and practices of all sorts. Now, you might think of an ethnographer as an anthropologist, and that is typically the image, but contemporary ethnographers still learn the same way early anthropological ethnographers did, but with some variations. Um, regardless, we still learn in virtue of people's generosity, their kindness and openness, and their willingness to teach us. As ethnographers, our work relies on meeting strangers, gathering knowledge, knowledge learning from what has been shared with us, and then putting that knowledge in a broader context and drawing insights uh, from what people have shared with us. Of course, we also refer to other researchers' work and many of the ideas that we draw from are not ours. They, are, they belong to those that have taught us both through books and of course, through the spoken word. Um, our work is focused on understanding or learning what, from what people can teach us and therefore accumulating experiences and perspectives in order to arrive at insights, new ideas, New life worlds that are often distant from our own can actually teach us a lot about our world. So we are driven by curiosity and wonder, but also by a critical mind uh, for things that people often take for granted, such as the meaning of the word wild. But we're also a family. Um, and therefore, as a family, we are different from other researchers. But we're also different from... Some of the authors, um, other people that write about wilderness, these are typically, let's be honest, uh, white young men who are out there to conquer the world and to tame it. And in the process of doing so, they will display their strength and their courage and resilience and their sense of adventure. We are not particularly adventurous, or at least not intensely so, much more than the average family. Um, so we traveled as a family who are really no different from many others. And as a family, we learned from the places that we visited, the people that we met, and then reflecting together, especially with a young girl who began this project uh, when, she was in, uh, when she was nine years old and um, finished when she was 16. And so we learned with her that of course changed our identity in the minds of the people that we met. 
Um, so from 2014 to 2020, uh, we traveled to 20 UNESCO World Heritage Sites um, inscribed for their outstanding natural heritage. Um, UNESCO has three categories for UNESCO World Heritage Sites, um, that of natural, that of cultural, and that of mixed. Um, the 10 UNESCO sites located in 10 different countries and four or five different continents and 10 sites located in Canada. So um, the international sites were in the Galapagos uh, in Ecuador, Tasmania in Australia, uh, New Zealand, um, Patagonia in Argentina, Iceland, Thailand, uh, Belize, Belize. <laughs> I'm going to forget, the Dolomites in Italy, um, and uh, then, then the 10 sites in Canada um, were in Alberta, uh, Yukon, Newfoundland, Northwest Territories, Nova Scotia, and Quebec. And I apologize if I'm missing one right now, but I feel like I am. Um, the book, however, is based on local inhabitants' perspectives of this notion or this idea of wilderness and wildness. We interviewed approximately 300 people altogether in this period of time. And uh, people came from all different walks of life, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Um, one of the reasons why we that is experienced and defined by visitors. Um, and, and when we think about that, visitors often see the absence of history or the absence of culture of development, um, the absence of social relations when we visit a place that you might not know it as deeply. Um, it's often referred to as something untouched, um, remote or distant because it's not close to your home. Um, inhabitants, however, see presence and inhabitants of these places lead us to kind of re-envision this notion of wildness as an idea rooted in connection, in connection and relation between human and non-human lives. Um, a vision based on, and you'll probably hear us say this time and time again, um, we talked a lot about it in the book, on kinship, relationality and respect. And in many cases, this notion of reciprocity as well. The one that we missed from oh. the list, oh. the Ogasawara Islands in Japan. in Japan, one of the most remote places in the world that one can visit. <laughs> But oh, we'll get to that. Um, so what's this project about? This is a five-year research project that resulted in two books and two films. The one that we're talking about today is called In the Name of Wild. There's a documentary by the same title um, and it focuses on all the projects. So all the 10 countries that April um, listed earlier, including Canada. But Canada, of course, takes a 10% a of, the, of the share, if you like. There is a second book and a second film called Inhabited. Um, the book is published by McGill Queens University Press. And that one, if you're interested, focuses exclusively on Canada. They're also a little bit different in the sense that In the Name of Wild was written for a general audience. Um, anyone from a high school student to a couch traveler, um, whereas Inhabited has a lot more uh, conceptual and philosophical and theoretical underpinning. So it's, it's put of a, it's intended for the academic audience, but it's a crossover book. And if you're interested in watching the films uh, through the websites, you can find links, uh, but you can also find them um, on Tubi, which is available without a subscription, as well as Vimeo on demand without advertising. So there's that. Um, so let's talk for a little bit about wild. Um, so wild, if we look at the etymology of the word, signifies something that is self willed. And relatedly, wilderness arises from a combination of wild and deor, which refers to a deer or more broadly a beast, and ness, which is a promontory or a cave. So it's essentially a place that abides by nothing but its own will. And typically here, we're talking about a non-human will, referring to, again, a deer or a beast. That word, wild, is used everywhere. I mean, you go into a bookstore and you find uh, that word in the title of so many books, but you also find the title of movies. And typically this is a way of making things sound pure or adventurous. And it's a kind of adventure, if you will, kind of relation to nature that is rooted in the writings of people like John Muir or uh, Thoreau. So American environmental literature classics. However, the word wild, can also be used in a more divisive and even militant way. It has been used historically as a way of justifying fortress style conservation. 
um, and therefore a way of excluding people from certain parts. Um, but it's also used sometimes in a more benign and yet commercial way as a way, for example, of promoting getaways or ecotourism or all kinds of things. So wild can actually reveal a lot of things but it tends to often reveal, at least in English speaking countries, a nature or places that must be protected from human interference. And so this is a kind of ideology, if you like, that has been at the root of many programs of eviction and resettlement that have displaced thousands of residents, indigenous people, away from parks, away from conserved areas, that they had traditionally treated as their home and were then later evicted um, and therefore became essentially conservation refugees. So uh, very briefly, a little bit about the title of the book because it reveals a lot. Uh, the title of the book is In the Name of Wild. And the idea is that when we say in the name of, we invoke some kind of a moral authority. So um, we act perhaps in the name of the law or in the name of God. So we bear the, uh, the, the power of someone greater than, our, than ourselves, someone whose moral authority we engage in order to protect a certain state of things. By saying in the name of wild, we kind of refer to that authority and we say that wildness isn't just a, a raw natural force, but it's rather an institution. It's been made into an institution. And therefore, it's a, it's a subject of governance, of environmental policy, of scientific knowledge, of local politics, international politics, and, and of course, complex social histories. And in the name of wild is therefore intended to remind us that wildness is nothing but a name. It's, it's an idea, it's a value, a value, a cultural value, and it's not a natural state of affairs, which is somehow universally valid and it transcends society and history. So by saying in the name of wild, we refer to the fact that there are different ideas, different values, different understandings of nature that vary across cultures. And that's why we're often you know, asked to, to explain ourselves, why is it not in the name of the wild? Well, the idea of saying the wild is basically implying there is such a thing as the wild, as a discrete or somehow tangible entity that you can sort of like identify, right? Uh, wild for us is something that doesn't have a definite article and therefore it's an indefinite idea. It's really a possibility. It's a, it's a potential, it's a, it's a multitude. It's, and that's a good thing too, because by saying that there is no such thing as the wild, what we're saying is that we're reopening up what it can mean. And the book really asks um, readers to reimagine what we could do in the name of a new kind of wild. And by doing that, we can gain a new moral authority to speak about wildness and hopefully one that is more inclusive, less anthropocentric, less ethnocentric, and above all, less Eurocentric. Um, and so that also speaks to this idea that wilderness is also if it hasn't been expressed already, it's also a very much of a colonial concept. It's a European, it comes from a colonial European language. It's a construct that still remains here today. Um, language has a history, um, but it also enacts social practices that are often passed down from generation to generation. A word like the Western idea of wilderness may appear on the surface universal or neutral, but in reality, it has resulted in um, devastating practices and historical and present day injustices um, for many scholars who have written and there's many people especially within environmental humanities who have kind of deconstructed this idea of wilderness um, this idea of wilderness comes from the uh, uh, enlightenment and and uh, the rationalism uh, philosophical thought that period of time where you know our scientific thought was influenced by these ideas like Descartes, uh, the difference between or the, the dichotomy between nature and culture or the dichotomy between mind and body. Um, the idea of wilderness is also enmeshed with this idea of nature, which also historically has had significant um, 
uh, influenced by this kind of rational way of thinking nature as an entity that is separate or independent from human consciousness. Um, this Western idea of wilderness is closely connected to this Western idea of uh, nature, pristine, untouched, untrammeled, free of human inhabitation. A lot of this stuff we have read in some of the great works like Philip already mentioned uh, John Muir and, and Thoreau. Um, and so these binary oppositions are really, really important to the work and to the research that we did to understand like the oppositions between nature and culture. Does that actually exist? Wilderness and home between inhabitant and uninhabited. Um, and also that rely on that kind of deeper opposition between us and them. Um, countless times our, our research and conversations with people revealed many instances where a uh, place became a wilderness only after settlers arrived. And, and let's just think about it, only after settlers arrived and removed indigenous people in order to create outdoor recreational sites, to create federal parks, um, protect and conserve nature for its pristine um, idea of what pristine nature is um, and, and keep a place free of human modifications. So as, as April said, um, we want to keep our presentation short uh, because we don't like to talk at you. We would rather talk with you and learn from your perspectives. And so we want to just wrap up and just offer some concluding thoughts and then we we'll can open up to discussion. What we do want to say in, in concluding is that we've had many conversations with people around the world, over 300 people. Um, many of those were indigenous people, people in communities whose lands we were visiting and learning from, people who taught us to view wildness as a relation, a relation that is entwined with a connection based in kinship and based on human values and use of the land. And, and these are relationships with wild places, with wildlife that ask us that we understand the past and presence of a place, a place that is still alive, a place that asks to be cared for, to be safeguarded for future generations. And it asks to be safeguarded together, not from a distance, but from a position of engagement. We, early on in the book, uh, moved away a little bit from the concept of wilderness and started to embrace more the concept of wildness. The idea of wilderness still tends to rely too much on absence, absence of people, a condition that once it's changed, you know, once wilderness is lost, it can never happen again. Whereas wildness is a relation, more of a, of, a, of a relation that is based on duties and obligations. And it's also a form of life. It's in our mind, uh, given what we have been taught, it's a form of aliveness itself. And both humans and non-humans share its gift of abundance. Wildness, we have been taught, gives us time to get away. It gives us a place to find ourselves, but it's also a place of sustenance, a place where indigenous languages come from, a place where laws, culture, and ancestors live. And the concept and idea of wildness speaks the relations, and it doesn't stop with the conservation of biological diversity. This is a really important point, but rather it encompasses, it should encompass, the protection of biocultural diversity. Wildness in the end can never be something separate from us, something that we are disconnected to, and therefore it asks that our kinship with it be based not on distance and disconnection, but rather on connection, respect, and reciprocity. So when we say in the name of wild, what we intend that wildness to mean, given what we have been taught, is that connection that respect and that reciprocity. And I think with that, um, we're happy to hear your thoughts, your questions, your comments, and um, learn from you. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. I was just checking off the list of questions that you addressed as I was going through there and going, oh, okay, we talked a little bit about that too. Uh, and I love that title, In the Name of Wild, and you explain in there how you how you came across that and how you came to that spot around uh, in the name of wild and i thought that was uh, uh that lent itself differently because it, as you mentioned when we talk about wilderness and wild 
people immediately have an idea in their head that's based from their readings, primarily from English readings and from those things that have been ingrained in our language and ways of thinking and our education systems uh, from early European thinkers. So I'd like to explore that a little bit. One of the things you talked about uh, while being an English word, and Philip, you talked about the etymology and where that comes from. Uh, but you, in exploring and being out there in the world and talking to people in other languages, of course, uh, came across some, some bumps in trying to explain what it was that you were doing, because those concepts and ideas uh, don't, uh, don't exist in the same format in other languages. So maybe you can talk a little bit about diff those different bumps and uh, approaches that people came to in their own language. We came across many bumps. Um, and I will talk about two kinds of bumps, one briefly and, and one will pay a bit more attention. Um, in Spanish's, uh, in, in Spanish's, in languages like Spanish, uh, Neo-Latin languages, there is really no exact translation for wild. So for example, in Spanish, the direct translation is salvaje. The same in Italian, it's selvaggio. These words are most closely translated through the word savage in English. Mm -hmm. And therefore it has that incredibly violent colonial heritage uh, that the word reveals. And we could talk about that for a long time and maybe we'll do that mm -hmm. a little bit later. But what was maybe even most revealing was when we didn't really abandon English, but rather when we were in Canada and we asked that question to, um, to First Nations around the country, who taught us that the meaning of wild was very, very, very different from them than it might have been for settlers. And we have a little, a little video of a um, someone that we spoke to. Her name is Mary Jane Johnson. Uh, we spoke to her in Burwash Landing, Yukon, uh, just outside the boundaries of Kluani National Park. Okay. And uh, we will. Play, it's just a one-minute uh, interview. It's it's not directly taken from the movie, but it's a clip that we put together. Um, partly for today's presentation. And I think that minute will reveal a lot about these okay. bumps, if you will, but also more broadly about the lessons that we were taught. So you can play that video if you'd like. Okay, can you see it? Oh, can we your can, see, we can see your screen stack? The screen. Not the, okay, hold on. Sorry about that. Um, can you see it now? You can see Stephanie Johnson's there it is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> People are, 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 are part of the wilderness. People are part of the land. My body does not survive day to day without being part of that land or without being part of that water. And there's find me one person on this earth who is not part of this land or part of that water where they live. And why are we putting ourselves outside of that, I, that idea of wilderness? Wilderness is just a, a goofy word for somebody that lived in, in, in a concrete block for uh, 20 years and came out and saw wild leaves for the first time or, or, or an, a, a, a moose or a bear for the first time. And, and um, no, we're not, we're not above this land and we're not below the water. We are part of it. Yeah, I, Thank think, you for I think she hit the nail on the head with that, right? It was, uh, I remember uh, I was with, with Lawrence and we were, we were at a place that's locally uh, here called uh, Wildwood Eco Forest. And we watched some of our language speakers laughing, trying to translate the word wild in Wildwood. And there just wasn't a word for that. And they, they would come up with a word, but they said, well, that's not really how it, how it is, right? And then they would laugh because they had some other connotations for what it was that they were trying to say. So I, I, I recognize that struggle uh, as part of the book. You, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Autumn, if you're all right. That, sure. Because yeah. one of them is uh, you got to do this with her. And, and in the book, you... Uh, share some parts and she shares some parts about seeing through her eyes about what it is that you were about. And so can you talk a little bit about the parts uh, that she's, because she's written part of the book, uh, in what ways you think that her involvement shaped your work as you did this? 
Sure. So we, it's funny because when we began this project, we knew that Autumn would be with us. We couldn't just leave her. <laughs> so she was going to be present with us, yeah. but we didn't necessarily know until we were probably um, going a little bit deeper into it and going to some different sites, the role that she actually played um, for us, right? She helped change our rhythms um, in many yeah. ways. <laughs> whether that's faster or slower um she sometimes made us slow down you know there was days where we we're like okay go 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 because we're doing research and i was like no <laughs> we're not gonna go 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 today we're going to, you know and so we she helped regulate us she helped us see things in a, in a different way um when your kids are young you always wonder oh what are they taking from this and you don't really know until maybe they're a little bit older and and so um, in 2020, when COVID hit, uh, we couldn't go anywhere. We were, the research, literally the field work was done. And so we were like, okay, well, we have to start writing now. Um, and we had one more site to complete um, that was in Africa, in Tanzania. So we had to cancel that. And uh, so we started writing um, the first book, Inhabited. And we started, Philip and I just started talking, we we're like, you know, I bet you Autumn has learned so much. She's, she's not really at school right now. <laughs> Let's see if she wants to reflect on some of these places and some of the, her own experiences. And we thought that's a really unique opportunity for her, but also a unique opportunity for readers of both the books um, mm -hmm. because our children are probably our best teachers <laughs> in many ways. They're my greatest teachers, my two children. And, and she taught us so much. Um, and she taught us more importantly about um, the ways how kids learn too, <laughs> that they learn through experience, and they learn through doing, and and uh, and that had a great impact on her because everything that she wrote, she wrote as a 14, 15 year old. And so it was a reflecting back on some of her younger years. Um, do you have anything to add? Uh, again, she was experiencing the same events in the same places, but through a different ways of being open to the world. And she has a passage in the book in which she writes about the wildness of a sudden um, thunderstorm and rainfall in the Alps at the end of a long day of hiking. And neither April nor I remember that particularly when she wrote about it. We were just tired. We just wanted to go to the hut. We just wanted to end the day. And Autumn was in a completely different world feeling and the connection with nature and 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 this, her surroundings that completely escaped us and again it really goes to speak to the fact that wildness is experienced differently by different people and it's often a feeling of connection with place that is experienced in many different ways at different times by different people differently yeah. mm -hmm. That was one of my <clears throat> favorite parts was uh, seeing Autumn's view of the world because it's been so long since I was <laughs> that age. But but also being a teacher for many, many years, right? I 11 year olds taught me so much about how to be in the world in a little more uh, curious way with a little more awe in the world. And so it was wonderful to see Autumn's views come through there. And maybe I'll just say, to, oh, on, oh, sorry, Ted, I just want to say really quickly, since there are um, teachers here, Autumn was a student in, in this school district, and it was incredibly great to see the teachers give Autumn the green light to go and take weeks off school and often <laughs> ask for nothing but an extended presentation or a blog uh, from her. And that is how many teachers and many of her classmates learned as well. So mm -hmm. shout out to School District 68 teachers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that external... Uh, credits for learning, right? Learning doesn't yeah. stop just because the bell goes. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the things that happened when I think it was uh, in New Zealand, uh, when there was a volcano there and and associated with wild. But one of the people that you interacted with said, well, that that's not wild. That's, that's a relative, mm -hmm. right? And they just talked about that relationship with land as family. And I, it struck me because we talk in our CSS policy within the Nanaimo Lady Smith Public Schools that it starts with land and out of land comes everything that's going to keep us healthy, happy, uh, and help us survive. Uh, language comes from there, culture comes from there, and it's it, and we're in a relationship with it. So I, I like that idea. Maybe you could expand a little bit on that about land as relative. 
Yeah, so um, this was in Tongariro National Park uh, in New Zealand. And um, Tongariro is actually the second oldest uh, national park in the world. Uh, when we were there, we um, came across a very unique designation that UNESCO had given the natural heritage, sorry, the heritage site. Instead of designated it as natural or cultural, they had given it a relatively new, uh, or at least not new, but infrequent designation, which was a mixed heritage site, therefore both natural and culture. And that is because in addition to its geological significance, it had incredibly powerful social and cultural and linguistic significance uh, for the people of the area who identified the various volcanoes in the park as their ancestors. And so it was a completely different ways of relating to the land than say the visitors who were just trying to hike around the day, the, the volcano in a single day it was one of the most popular mm -hmm. New Zealand hikes. But just to give an example of what we learned that day and that week, actually, I should say, just across the street from Tongariro National Park, there was another park, which was designated differently, but it was really part of the same area. And that park was the, uh, uh, that was the Wanganui uh, Park. And the Wanganui River had been recently given one of the most um, innovative legal designations that the world has ever seen, the river itself has been given legal personhood. So what mm -hmm. does that mean? It means that it can stand as part of a legal process um, as a person and therefore with all the rights, duties um, of, of a human person. Uh, and that is because it is viewed not just as a resource, if you like, uh, but rather as a being of its own with its own um, uh, rights, which of course has opened up all kinds of different um, discussions within environmental law, because now other people around the world are starting to learn from this connection to place and how environmental bodies, beings, can have the same rights that people do. So just to give an example of, of what we, uh, we learned there, that was much more powerful than the tourist brochure might have, might have told you. Uh, when that happened, we were uh, in indigenous education and in indigenous worlds all over the place. We were so excited because in, in many of our worlds, that's reality. Right, their uh, ancestors are on this land. They've been transformed into rivers, and they've been transformed into all sorts of things because they've served uh, the people so well that that was their reward. Right, you can continue to do that even even after you've passed as a human. And so that's quite that was quite exciting to see that come up in the book as well. There's there's some friction though, right, in the book too about the concept of wild and trying to preserve that concept uh, in the face of, of uh, ecotourism and tourism as well too. And it struck me because as a little boy, uh, like many uh, little kids, I was, I was thrilled to learn about the Galapagos Islands and iguanas and land tortoises. And, and so I had this vision of uh, the Galapagos, which was, uh, uh, you shone a bright light on my realities. <laughs> in the book because you got to go there and see what was there. I still had this vision even even before just before I read the book that it was this pristine environment with very few human beings there, but ecotourism got to come there and was controlled. Can you talk a little bit about the struggle around wild and parks and uh, trying to preserve that in the face of economic needs and, and human beings? Yeah, so... Um... Again, you know, the Galapagos is where the book starts because it, like you, many people have this vision of a and wild like place, us. like yeah. us too, yeah. before leaving. <laughs> many people have the vision of, of a wild place as a place where there is no one else but animals and plants and rocks. And um, our first reaction as we landed and seeing some of the litter that were on the streets in front of the airport was one of, of disappointment. But it wasn't too long until we realized that it wasn't about be dis being disappointed, but it was about learning that wildness is a very careful, wilderness even more, a very careful operation. Uh, it is something that is created, manufactured, regulated, policed, managed, enforced, monitored, reported on, funded, mm -hmm. just like anything else in the world. 
And um, in the Galapagos, that often had taken place at the expense of local people who as a result were feeling, in their own words, uh, third world citizens. Abandoned. Abandoned, because first it was wildlife, it was the animals. Uh, Secondly, it was uh, the uh, outsiders, uh, whether in the form of, of tourists or researchers, environmental scientists, and ultimately the local people. So I think that's where really the seeds of the project started um, sprouting because we started learning about how different the experience of a local person is and how often locals are excluded from the places they have traditionally called home in order to make way, to make space for this notion of wilderness as a pristine environment. And in Canada, if you don't mind taking this on, in places like Kluani, in places like uh, Waterton Lakes, uh, we learned that often that had taken place at the expense of local people by way of eviction. Mm -hmm. They were literally taken out of the lands that um, bear their names, their family names, to uh, (laughs) to, Mm -hmm. to, uh, create this purified and sanctified notion of nature as untouched and pristine. Uh, without really a full understanding of the fact that indigenous people had developed relations with that land, had modified that land, had used that land uh, since time immemorial. So some of the things that pop up when you talk about this is, uh, well, we've got governments and organizations who really like that idea of pristine wilderness and uh, think that that's a good idea to impose upon the land. So as you learn through your travels and conversations about this, do you have any advice or some principles on how we might move forward with preserving that idea of, you know, of of non-commercial use of, maybe there is commercial use, but maybe there's some ideas that policy makers can take into consideration. Well, I think if we start from the TRC and we speak to that, First off and foremost, we know that in Canada, that is that is the, the world that we're living in right now is through this idea of the TRC and the many different ways we need to begin to reconcile and atone for these uh, colonial mistakes. Um, and so one of the things that we learned um, throughout Canada and some of the UNESCO sites are federal parks, some of them are provincial parks. Um, I don't think anything was a city park for the UNESCO sites. Um, I think there was a nature reserve. Um, we, we spoke to a lot of people who worked for Parks Canada and they were very open with discussing this, this history of parks, um, specifically Parks Canada or even provincial parks and the role that they're taking now in, um, in, in understanding the ways in which they have to work in collaboration and in cooperation with. Um, and then on the other end of things, we go and speak mm-hmm. to Indigenous people who say, yes, that relationship is starting. It's just starting. Um, mm-hmm. There's a long way to go. What is happening on paper is one thing, but what's happening on the ground is also another thing. And so there's a long way to go before we come to some kind of way that it's where parks or ways that we administer parks or how we understand how a park could be used um, is inclusive to Indigenous ways because Indigenous people's lands. Um, But I also think one of the things that I I loved about this project is that it always opens your your mind up to other things. Okay, well, if there's Parks Canada, if there's provincial parks, how can we understand parks differently in which way? And one of the things that we began to reveal for ourselves, and we never, we didn't write about this because it's still something that we are learning about, is thinking about um, conservation and preservation from an indigenous perspective, not through the lens of Parks Canada, but through tribal parks. Um, and things like um, a Neutronist scholar, Eli Enns, who talks about indigenous conservation in um, preserved areas and how indigenous communities can open those. And that is much different than I say, I think Parks Canada, because that begins in culture and it begins mm-hmm. through the indigenous laws of that land. Whereas Parks Canada still has that kind of administrative piece that is very colonial, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that 
the direction that I think it should go is into these ICPAs, right? Tribal parks, and it, it's founded in indigenous knowledge and indigenous laws itself. Right? And I think that we can have conservation and preservation of these beautiful places that we so admire and, and, and use, but it could come from that, that place of ICPAs and indigenous culture and knowledge. And mm -hmm. as travelers, we have no control over social and environmental policy, um, but there are things that we can do. And I think the most basic the most elementary, but the most important is to educate ourselves about the places that we're about to visit. There's a tendency for people to view travel as a getaway that gives you the license to do whatever you want in someone else's land. And I think that's incredibly dangerous, especially when we visit places that appear to be untouched, that appear to be pristine, but we fail to understand their history and why they appear the way they do. And so understanding the history, the social history, the environmental history of a place that you're about to visit, I think can only enrich your experience of the place. It can allow you to make connections with the people that live there and it can allow you to be a better, more responsible citizen of the globe. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately a more um, responsible uh, traveler who is a better guest. Yes. And, and to, to speak to that too is that often it, and and say we were this conscious traveler ah oh, but what is the indigenous name of this place oh there isn't one well that doesn't mean there isn't one <laughs> or you don't know how to find it um with colonialism and settlers moving here you know settler colonialism is based on this idea of erasure um and erasing and that has what that's what's happened here in Canada and in much of um, the colonized world um, in Latin America, et cetera, is that these things have been erased. And it was because of this very violent act of coming and taking and saying that this land was empty of people. And now we're going to plop our names on here and reconfigure the maps, right? So it, it comes also with our own deep reflection of who we are again. Mm -hmm. Where do my ancestors come from? Um, how do I relate to that place? Even though I was born and raised here in Canada, more specifically in the name of territory, my ancestors don't come from this place. Right? I don't know the language that comes from that land, this land, these waters, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so much as settlers that we don't know that it's foreign to us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is one of the things that I always think about as traveling is that this place is foreign to us because we're not from here. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, thank you for that, April too. And then the work that, uh, another piece of work that we have going on in the name of territory is going back and finding those names and putting them back on the maps. There is great, great beauty in the, in the words and the stories that come out of that work that uh, uh, is just, has not been, uh, it just did not been exposed and probably for good reason at the moment uh, until it's safe to do that. But there's just great beauty and stories. And I think that exists on all of our lands across the earth. Now there, we've got a little while left, but I know as in any learning that comes along for any human being, there's these moments where you go, oh, wow, <laughs> that's something that I just did not see coming. So there's an aha moment in there. Can either of you or both of you talk to those moments where you go, uh -huh. um, You can go first, but I'll also say that the, the entire project was uh, constantly full of those moments <laughs> because when you meet 300 people, uh, and this is, this is where I think April's gonna go, when you meet 300 people and, and they all open up um, their minds and their hearts and their homes, we met people in their homes often, uh, everything is, is a revealing experience, right? <laughs> That's exactly mm -hmm. where I was going to go. You know, I I think both Philip and I already knew this in many ways that people are good. There's goodness in people, um, but when you experience it over and over and over again, this this hospitality um, to be welcomed, to be cared for, um, to be taught, <laughs> to be taught, to teach us, to teach us about their place. Um, to to live in their homes for a period of time because we didn't have you know there wasn't hotels in that area and you know there's just there's so many incidences and I reflect on this all the time and I, I never know how best to articulate it but it's this 
generosity, this overwhelming generosity that was gifted to us. And they were, they were gifts. Um, and Robin Wall Kimier talks about gifts in this beautiful essay. And if you ever have a reader, please do. It's called Service Berry, The Economy of Abundance. And that is what I think was aha for me was this abundance of gifts that were, were given to us. Um, and it will never, ever, I'll never forget it because um, there was so much that was taught to us. Um, the gift of Lawrence today opening us up in this way, right? Um, with when you, when you receive gifts, um, there's also a, a, a relationship of humility. Right. I learned this the other day when someone was gifting me lunch. <laughs> oh, no, you don't have to gift me lunch. No, no, I do. Because you spent your time with me today. Oh, OK, thank you. Um, and so I think that that um, probably maybe not so much an aha moment, but the moments that will always stick with us the most is that the way we were cared for um, and not just by people, but how the land cared for us. I can we can just there's just so many instances that people cared for us. And I think that that notion of hospitality can also come up to this idea of how we said that we can't define wilderness. The gifts that have been given to us has said that there's a multitude of ways of thinking about this place um, and those teachings, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. you have to do service to what that is. There's, there's many ways to think of wilderness and wildness. Yeah. Well, I would just wanna thank you both for that. Uh, that's been my experience too it's just uh, being welcomed being gifted being looked after it always strikes me as as gratitude at the central piece of places in the world that i've been to um and uh thank you for this gift of you sharing this time with us and you're learning with us um i'm going to uh close up my piece and turn it over to its own to close our house and share any thoughts that he has as well Ail Agnes Qualowan Santa Matama Atan Hui Huiam Atanaquail, Aizaka, Nastlikwanas Zayas Namat Stoch, School District 68, UBC Press, E. Kerry Kilmartin, E. Vancouver Island Regional Libraries, Aizaka Makwet, Olmets the Thimat CIs at the School District 68, Aizaka, Nastlikwanas. See at the Philip E. April. Uh I'll eight nishqualo and say the matama e than hui huiam. Uh I really love that that sense of belonging that you're talking about and how you're able to feel it wherever you went, and how that opening of the their hearts and minds just cradled you and comforted you inside here. That's one of the best feelings. And I think about when I really started to honor and acknowledge my drum as a part of my spirit and i created a dance uh, about hunting and i started singing the song and my kids were like five and seven and there's this part of the dance where they kind of duck down and it's like they're going through the bush and i was sitting there uh, above them singing i looked down and i seen them going like this and i'm like oh whoa that was my aha moment how real that connection is between everything in creation that interconnectedness and i knew i was taking the right you know steps in my life to understand who i am and i'm you know i'm so fortunate that i'm able to uh, come forward in a meaningful way through my drum and through the songs that come from the land and i really honor and acknowledge you guys on behalf of the school district and really raising our hands to both of you and looking forward to uh, hearing more about your adventures and what the world is telling you guys because sometimes some of us will live vicariously through you and <laughs> we need that magic so um, thank you all thank you thanks for joining us everyone Hey, Thank you.